Hello, everybody, and welcome to the second uh, session of the Educational Day Online. Um, the topic is Spotlight on Gene Therapy and Treatment in New or Unknown PIDEA. And I hope that we uh, will have uh, time to discuss in the end, in the live question and answer uh, session, you all have a um, device to ask your question during the talk of the different uh, speakers. Um, the session will start with the topic, uh, the basic of gene therapy for PID given by Fabio Candotti. Fabio Candotti got his medical degree of the University of Brescia in Italy. He trained uh, in Brescia and Pavia in Italy before moving to the US where he did a postdoctoral uh, fellowship in the clinical gene therapy branch of the NIH. He stayed there, was a long time a senior investigator in uh, the NIH in Bethesda. Uh, and now, since several years, he is back to Europe, where he's uh, currently the head of the Division of Immunology and Allergy in the University Hospital Lausanne in Switzerland. He is uh, also a member of the ESIT board as a treasurer. We will then have a second talk given by Joao Neves. Um, the topic is Leaky Adolescent Skid Patient, How to Treat. Joao um, got his medical degree uh, from the University of Coimbra in uh, Portugal. He then completed his training in pediatrics with a special interest in infectious diseases and primary immunodeficiencies. We had the pleasure to have him uh, six months in our department in um, Paris, in Necker en Fonds Malade. And he now, uh, since 2009, works in the infectious diseases and primary immunodeficiency unit of the um, hospital Dona Estefania in uh, Portugal. He's uh, a NASIT board member, the chair of the working party PID in development. The session will be shared by two uh, long-standing experts in um, transplantation for children in primary immunodeficiency. This is Mary Slatter from Newcastle in the uh, UK and Manfred Hönig from Ulm in Germany. And so I hope that we will have a lively discussion in the end of the session. So please uh, think about your, about your questions and post them so that we can then really um, interact as good as possible in this virtual setting. So enjoy the session. Hello. Um, my job today is to give you some basic notions about the use of gene therapy for primary immunodeficiency diseases. I have nothing to disclose. So starting from the very beginning, uh, the concept of gene therapy is pretty simple and is based on the idea that if we can obtain the hematopoietic stem cells from a patient with a primary immunodeficiency and correct the genetic defect that is responsible for his disease, followed then by the engraftment of these cells back into the patients, then these cells will develop, uh, express the corrected gene in all the daughter cells of the lymphohematopoietic system. And therefore, these cells will be corrected and able to correct the disease, uh, no matter whether the disease is pre predominantly caused by uh, defects of the lymphocytes, like in the, the severe combustion immunodeficiency or in the effect of the myeloid system like in the, the uh, chronic granulomatose disease or if there's a mixed uh, immunodeficiency with both lymphoid and myeloid problems like the Wiscott-Aldrich syndrome. 
Now, why should we think about uh, having gene therapy as an option for primary deficiency diseases? There are many different reasons, but one of the most compelling, of course, is that for some diseases, the available treatment are not satisfactory. Uh, I'm giving you here the example of adenosine deaminase deficiency, uh, which can be treated by injections of uh, uh, PEG-ADA in, in, uh, as an enzyme replacement therapy or can be treated with allogeneic bone marrow transplantation. As you can see from these two graphs here, the probability of survival is less than 100% in both cases and therefore that leaves room for improvement, even though these treatments, of course, are life-saving life I'm sorry, and, and uh, can be used to, uh, uh, to pr prolong the life of our patients. Now, if we look at uh, comparing hematopoietic stem cell gene uh, therapy, I'm sorry, hematopoietic stem cell uh, tr uh, transplantation and gene therapy, gene therapy has certainly the advantage of being based on the use of autologous cells. This means that patients are their own donors and therefore every patient has this, uh, 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 this treatment available to them. In autologous uh, treatment also means that there is no risk for graft source disease and that a reduced preparative chemotherapy uh, can be utilized compared to um, myeloablative uh, therapies that are often re uh, re required for hematopoietic stem cell transplant. Of course, uh, however, there are the, the some drawbacks of using gene therapy uh, versus hematopoietic stem cell transplant. And one of them is that transplant is based on the use of primary non-cultured cells, whereas the gene therapy procedure, the gene transfer procedure, requires the cells to be cultured in vitro for a few days, which can change the biology of these cells and potentially also change their stem uh, cell characteristics. Another difference, an important difference, is that hematopoietic stem cell transplant is based on the infusion of 100% gene normal cells. Those are cells from a normal individual. Whereas as, as good as gene transfer efficiency can be in, uh, in current gene therapy procedures, there will be always a fraction of cells that are not corrected and therefore a variable percentage of gene corrected cells that are infused after a gene therapy procedure, which can be uh, responsible for a reduced uh, therapeutic efficiency um, uh, uh, at the end. So, uh, how do we do gene therapy? Um, in order for the genetic corrections to be long lasting, we need to use tools that allow for a stable integration of the genetic or the correcting genetic material into the target cells. Uh, from the very beginning of gene therapy for immunodeficiencies, these tools were based on viruses. And in, in, in this slide, you see uh, a a schematic representation of, of a murine gamma retrovirus, which had been that which had developed their ability of transferring their genetic material to the nucleus of uh, target cells. Uh, murine gamma retroviruses were used from uh, at the very from the very uh, early days of gene therapy for primary immune deficiency because of their simple molecular biology. As you see here, they only have a viral promoter followed by a series of structural genes that can be easily removed to make space for the gene of interest that we want to transfer. This gene of interest can be expressed under the control of the viral promoter, as described here, or under the control of an internal promoter if we want to get away from using the, uh, the uh, promoter elements of the virus. Now, this this uh, both these contrasts were extensively used uh, in uh, clinical trials, uh, but from the very beginning, it was clear that this was not the uh, ideal tool for gene therapy of primary deficiency, where the target cells is the hematopoietic stem cell, because these vectors, these viruses, do not have the ability of entering the nucleus and delivering their genetic material unless the nuclear membrane is dissolved, which happens only 
only when cells are dividing. Being that hematopoietic stem cells are mostly quiescent cells and in, they are um, present in a non-dividing state, this was a big limitation for the use of gamma retroviruses as gene transfer vectors. So very uh, quickly enough, let's say, uh, the field moved uh, to the use of uh, retroviral vectors based on lentiviruses. In this case here, you see a schematic representation of HIV type 1, which have the important characteristic of, of being able to enter the nucleus of non-dividing cells, which makes them a much more useful tool for gene transfer into hematopoietic stem cells. As you can see here, the molecular biology of this virus is more complex, but the uh, strategy is the same, the structural and regulatory genes are removed to make space for the gene of interest that in this case is expressed under the control of an internal promoter. These uh, viruses, these uh, viral vectors uh, needs to be made uh, by using packaging cell lines, mammalian cells that are able to package this construct into uh, complete variants. And then these uh, variants are produced as a cell supernatant that can be uh, kept frozen until use. Once the viral vectors is uh, uh, available, uh, of course, we need to obtain the target cells. And these target cells, uh, being uh, that they are the hematopoietic stem cells are resident in the in the bone marrow and they can be obtained by bone marrow harvest a direct puncture of the uh, the bone uh, marrow and aspiration of uh, the bone marrow blood or these cells can be induced to tr uh, to transition into the peripheral blood by and mobilization from where they can be collected through leucophoresis procedures. In both cases, uh, the cells that are more, uh, they are, they have the characteristics of uh, uh, hematopoietic stem cells need to be isolated uh, through their expression of the CD34 marker uh, through uh, some in immunomagnetic procedures. And after this isolation, the cells are cultured um, in presence in the presence of our viral vectors uh, for one or two days, depending on the protocols, before being reinfused uh, and intravenously to our patients, uh, which may or may not have received a preparatory uh, chemotherapy. So th this is the process, uh, of course, looks simple but uh, the, uh, developing this process has been complex uh, over the years but over the, the past 20 years or so many of these approaches have transitions to the clinical phase and as you can see here uh, the majority of the diseases for which clinical applications are available are uh, forms of severe combined immune, defi combined immune deficiency which is uh, uh, reasonable given that these are the most severe form of immune deficiency but also we have uh, the whiskot older syndrome and other uh, and forms of innate Im immune defects like the chronic granulomatous disease and the leukocyte addition deficiency type 1 that uh, have been treated uh, have been um, uh, treated clinically with gene therapy protocols and I have to tell you that in general, uh, for several of these diseases that have transitioned to the clinical phase, we have uh, encouraging and in some cases solid results of uh, uh, efficiency uh, of, of the treatment. Here, I have um, show, I'm showing you a few uh, papers, just the last publications for each of these diseases uh, without really taking anything away from prior publications uh, that have shown uh, results in the, in, in the same diseases. But uh, those of you that want to read these papers, that, given that they are the, the, more, the most recent, will also uh, find in the, in the references, of course, reference to prior experiences. As you can see here, we have uh, clinical results for severe combined immunodeficiency 
type X1, so the X-linked SCID, uh, for the X-linked chronic granulomatose disease, for adenosine deaminase deficiency, of course, and for the Wiscott aldrich syndrome. Uh, more recently, uh, diseases, uh, newer diseases have in, entered the clinical arena. Uh, they have been presented as, like, as case reports or as a preliminary uh, results at meetings. So they, they are, these data are only uh, available in uh, in uh, abstract uh, form and some of them will be presented here at the meeting but of course this means that the field is expanding and the results of gene therapy you know will uh, will have to be considered now as as a, a true alternative to uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplant. I'm not going into the details of the results because Dr. Booth on Saturday will have, uh, will give her presentation exactly on this topic and you will see uh, hopefully the data, uh, specific data for, for these diseases in, in her presentation. I'm going to just transfer, to, um, transition to talk about some of the challenges that uh, gene therapy for immune deficiency for immune deficiency still faces fa uh, faces and uh, in uh, in particular uh, there are the uh, issue that we already mentioned about the fact that gene therapy uh, requires a period of ex vivo culture of the hematopoietic stem cells and the consequences on, on the true stemness of the, of these cells are still unknown. Uh, I need to remind you that gene therapy has been around for 20 years, uh, uh, but not 40 or 45 years as hematopoietic stem cell transplant and therefore whether or not there would be a long-term effect of gene therapy of, of uh, the um, transplantation of gene corrected autologous cells that have been cultured ex vivo for a while it's, it's still an open question uh, although of course we have patients that have been treated and continue to carry their gene corrected cells for for more than, de than a decade now one uh, issue that, that is in common between hematopoietic stem cell transplant gene therapy is the difficulty of treating older patients uh, in which uh, the, the function of the thymus is being reduced due to age and uh, gene therapy has uh, not yet been able to resolve that question uh, even though um, recent recent uh, experiments of gene therapy for Wiscott in older patients have, have shown uh, um, some efficiency and therefore encouraging results. Gene therapy, a difference uh, from hematopoietic stem cell transplant, has shown uh, that the insertion of uh, uh, vectors, viral vectors, can cause insertion on oncogenesis. And this, of course, has been a problem that the gene therapy field had to contend early on uh, during its development. And uh, in the early trials of gene therapy for X linked skid, it was uh, unfortunately uh, clear that the integration of the viral vector uh, in the proximity of uh, promoter regions of oncogenes could activate these oncogenes and lead to the develop development of leukemia. Several patients in trials of uh, gene therapy for an X-linked skid using gamma retroviral vectors have shown this problem, which unfortunately was confirmed also in the first trial of uh, uh, gene therapy for the Wiscott Aldrich syndrome. Uh, they are also uh, uh, under the use of a gamma retroviral vector. This was obviously uh, a serious problem from the field that reacted uh, by moving away from the use of gamma retroviral vectors and really investing in the use of lentiviral vectors that are the vectors that are commonly used, uh, that are currently uh, used for the majority of applications uh, uh, for immunodeficiencies. Continuing with the discussion of the challenges of gene therapy for primary deficiencies, as uh, any new investigational drug, gene therapy has to contend with the 
difficult uh, path uh, to drug registration. As of today, only one uh, gene therapy product for immune deficiencies has reached uh, registration in Europe, and that is Trimvelis, the gamma retroviral vector gene transfer procedure for adenosine deaminase deficiency. Hopefully, other products will reach registration uh, as well soon. Another problem, the burdens, uh, the uh, gene therapy applications uh, for primary deficiency is the lack of widespread availability, which is due to the fact that only a few centers worldwide have the capability of performing large-scale transductions uh, that are needed for clinical application. One possible uh, solutions for that would be for these centers uh, to receive fresh bone marrow samples from uh, harvest uh, performed locally uh, at the locations where the patients are taken care of, perform gene transfer on these samples, and then cryopreserve them uh, before sending them back to the location of the patients uh, where they could be infused. That way, uh, the locations where gene therapy is available will be uh, markedly increased and enlarged. Finally, another problem for gene therapy is that there are many more uh, target diseases that would benefit from its application. And many of these diseases uh, are due to d defects in genes that are the expression of which is finally regulated and for which a gene addition approach as the one uh, utilized uh, so far are not uh, sufficient. Therefore, new strategies are necessary and are being developed in the field. New strategies are based on gene addition approaches, a new technology that I'm sure you have heard talking about. Gene therapy currently performed is based on gene addition. So uh, the utilization of transfer vector that transfer gene expression cassettes uh, that contain both promoters and uh, cDNA sequences that land randomly in the, in the genome and they are expressed in a constitutive way. This random integration uh, it can possibly inactivate some essential gene causing uh, cell death, for instance, but it can also uh, uh, result in insertion oncogenesis, uh, as we have discussed before. Therefore, these strategies are definitely inferior to the possibility of inserting genetic material or correcting genetic material exactly at the locus of uh, uh, the gene of interest. This locus-specific insertion would, of course, avoid uh, the random integration of the uh, currently used viral vectors, uh, would not expose uh, the procedure to the insertion oncogenesis risks, and would be able to use the endogenous promoter uh, sequences, therefore utilizing the physiological regulation machinery of the cells. In addition, uh, this, this process would be, uh, hopefully be able to provide a correction of both alleles and therefore restoration of a full gene expression capability uh, in the cells. This process, gene editing, uh, can be performed with different technology. The one that is uh, nowadays uh, mostly utilized for immunodeficiency, for primary immunodeficiency, is the CRISPR-Cas technology. This technology is based on the use of a guide RNA that is complementary to the uh, sequence of interest that is uh, near the, the mutation of the gene that we want to correct. Uh, the, the binding of a DNA to the, to the sequence of interest allows for the Cas9 nuclease to bind to the region and perform a double-strand cut. Uh, left to its own, this cut will be repaired by uh, the DNA repair machinery of the cells uh, through a non-homology and joining uh, process, uh, which will result in a deletion of an insert of nucleotides and therefore most likely in the loss of function. But this process can also be uh, hijacked uh, to obtain an integration of a DNA sequences exactly at the, at the locus of interest, therefore 
potentially uh, allowing for homology-directed recombination and repair uh, of the mutations that is causing disease. This approach is being uh, used in the field of primary deficiency for, for several years now, and as a result, in a series of publications, they, are, uh, they show the feasibility in vitro and in in vivo models of disease of this uh, technology. Here, again, I show you some of recent examples of uh, articles showing this uh, possibility uh, that has been uh, proven for uh, X-linked and uh, autosomal recessive chronic granulomatous disease for the X-linked hyper IgM syndrome, for X-linked skid, the whiskot oldy syndrome, and for IPEX. Just briefly, I wanted to show you some results from a, a recent paper uh, looking at the use of CRISPR-Cas mediated homologous combination for the whiskot oldy syndrome uh, from the group of Adrian Trasher and Alessia, Alessia Cavazza. As you can see here, the strategy is to target with a guide RNA the region uh, close to the ATG uh, of the whiskot oldy syndrome protein gene locus and to perform um, uh, homologous recombination uh, uh, mediated insertion of a codon optimized uh, uh, Wiscott Aldrich syndrome uh, gene cDNA. At the end of the process, at the locus, uh, we would have a, a codon optimized uh, cDNA sequence uh, under the control of the endogenous promoter uh, sequences. This process uh, was performed uh, utilize, utilizing hematopoietic uh, stem cell progenitor, uh, stem, stem and progenitor cells from uh, four whiskered patients that, that were and then underwent the CRISPR-mediated uh, gene correction. And as a model, uh, the authors um, used these this cells to differentiate in vitro microphages and uh, that were used to verify the effect of this gene correction. One of the many things that the, the, the authors uh, looked at was the expression, the, the capability of this of this procedure to restore expression of WASP in these cells. And as you can see here, uh, macrophages uh, derived from the, the gene-corrected hematopoietic stem cells were able to express the uh, whiskered uh, protein uh, at, different at different levels, but even uh, at levels that were higher of uh, uh, cells that were gene corrected using a lentiviral vectors that is currently used in clinical trials. So these are um, some um, uh, results that show the feasibility and the efficacy of, of this treatment, and they are encouraging for further uh, development of these strategies for these and other diseases. Gene, gene editing, however, has its own series of uh, challenges. Uh, gene editing as gene addition requires ex vivo culture of uh, cells, though, and therefore, the potential negative consequences of, uh, ex, of uh, in vitro culture uh, apply to this, uh, to this strategy as well. Uh, the delivery of the Cas9 guide RNA uh, machinery is still an issue. Uh, it can be easily, uh, this, this complex can be easily electroporated or transferred using viral vectors, uh, but the, uh, these processes need to be optimized to, perf to achieve high level of uh, gene transfer without causing toxic effects on the, on the targets. Targeting of the guide RNA and the Cas9 uh, complex to the gene, to the sequence of interest is specific enough. Uh, the, it's always possible that this uh, the guide RNA would also um, recognize some sequences outside of uh, of the intended target targets, and therefore the possibility of off target modification and double strand breaks need to be continuously studied. 
Finally, uh, the frequency of the integration of the sequence of interest at the location of interest uh, needs to be optimized uh, to be uh, clinically uh, meaningful. Uh, in vitro, uh, the, the, sequency, the frequency uh, currently achievable is around 50-60%, but the frequency that then is achieved in vivo is much lower and therefore more efforts need to be dedicated uh, to this uh, to this aspect of the technology. Uh, Tony Cattleman uh, on Friday will uh, tell you everything that I didn't tell you about this uh, CRISPR-Cas system and he's an expert uh, on, 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 on this technology and I certainly recommend that you uh, uh, try to uh, attend that uh, that presentation. I'm going to stop here and uh, uh, thank you and hopefully uh, try to answer some questions. Hello, I am Jean Epps from Lisbon. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank the, um, the organization for inviting me, especially uh, Despina Moshuz. It's a privilege to be here in this um, well-reputed educational day. And I'm going to present um, a clinical report about uh, an 11-year-old patient with leaky skin uh, in order to, uh, to kick off the discussion about uh, treatment in these uh, difficult patients. So it's adolescent with leaky skin, how to treat. First of all, I have nothing to disclose. And um, we first met this uh, young patient at the age of three and a, and a half years of age. Uh, it's a boy who was admitted for uh, pneumococcal pneumonia, complicated with MPMA, requiring IV antibiotics and pleural drainage. And um, his uh, previous history was... Um, almost unremarkable. He only had some diarrhea that had started at the age of two and was recurrent. And the parents all also really um, talked about three episodes of oral candidiasis that were treated topically. He grew very well. He was on the 50th percentile of weight and height, and his development was perfect. On the other hand, his family history was remarkable for um, he had two uncles, maternal uncles, who had died at, before the age of 12 months because of an, an infectious episode. So, uh, And then his uh, aunt also had a miscarriage uh, that was uh, not explained. So this prompted us to uh, perform some uh, some more investigations about uh, this patient. And uh, when we did the immunological assessment of this patient, we found that he was very lymphopenic. So we have a, a severe CD3 um, lymphopenia, about 500 cells, and uh, um, a naive T cells uh, lymphopenia with uh, about 30% of all CD4s were only 30% were naive. And the functional studies of the T cells uh, show that the patient had almost pr normal preserved responses, proliferative responses to phytohemoglutinin and for PMA and, and anti-CD3. But uh, on the other hand, it didn't, it didn't respond to recall antigens such as Candida or PPD. Um, his B cells were normal, as were the NK cells, and he had a normal IgG and IgM, uh, but he failed to mount a response to vaccines, as shown for in the, in the last line for the anti-tetanus, which he had an almost absent titer. And the second column, we can see that the, the value after being revaccinated, so he didn't mount any response to, uh, to the uh, tetanus vaccine. At that time, we have an attentive, uh, attempted the diagnosis of leaky skid, a TLO B plus and K plus leaky skid, uh, despite having a uh, normal uh, response, proliferative responses to PHA. Uh, that was our uh, diagnosis to begin with. He was put on prophylaxis with cotrimoxazole and uh, he started on IVIG in the beginning and then switched for cutaneous uh, immunoglobulin replacement therapy. Uh, at that time, at the age of three and a half years old, we first talked with the parents about hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, and uh, they were very reluctant to even talk about this procedure. 
We then performed some genetic uh, investigations and whole exome sequencing revealed um, a novel hemizygous missense mutation on the IL-2 receptor gene um, uh, glutamine 297 glycine uh, missense variant, uh, which was novel, was inherited from the mother, and uh, uh, was apparently uh, causal in this patient. It was absent from databases, it was very, very conserved, and almost the bioinformatic tools uh, showed that it was a deleterious variant. So, we then performed some function anal analysis to, to prove that this uh, variant was indeed causal. So, um, his expression of the gamma common chain was uh, nearly absent. And then when we, we studied the star 5 phosphorylation assay post uh, some uh, interleukin stimuli, and they were absent post IL-7 and IL-2, um, thus proving that this uh, variant was indeed uh, the cause of the, of his disease. So, we had a four-year-old boy with a leaky x link ski diagnosis uh, and a parental refusal for hematopoietic stem cell transplantations, uh, transplantation. Uh, we sent these parents that were a, a very dedicated couple, but an old couple because the mother was 48. It was the only child of his mother uh, and the father was a 58-year-old um, uh, sir, and we, we sent them to our BMT units and they refused to have their son transplanted. So it was a very difficult decision. Uh, the patient was referred abroad, but the parents also refused uh, to hear second opinions because in their words, their, his, their children were, was uh, very, very well. So they refused. One year after, we diagnosed the cryptosporidiosis, intestinal cryptosporidiosis that was treated with bromomycin and nitazoxanide. And uh, it's the same picture with normal life and uh, the kid that was in, the, in school and uh, everything was going okay. From the age of five to the age of eight, nothing very special occurred, not many infections. And at the age of eight, he had the first episode of zoster. He had had um, a very mild varicella um, uh, somewhere between the age of five and six. And then he had this zoster that requ required hospitalization for uh, IV a cyclovi for 21 days. At this time, he was eight. The parents told that he was the smartest kid in class and they didn't want him to be transplanted because uh, that would change their lives. They didn't want to have uh, that happen. So we have um, a refusal and we have obviously an accident waiting, waiting to happen. The next years were dreadful, and at that time, um, the patient lost his ability to proliferate to mitogen, so he's, uh, he didn't proliferate after being challenged with a PHA or PMA or anti-CD3, CD3, um, and he started to have uh, lots of complications. So, he first developed one um, clinical picture of a sh septic shock along with uh, toxic megacolon and EBV viremia that required an hospitalization in intensive care units uh, and was treated with rituximab and antibiotics and eventually resolved. Sometime later, he had this um, extensive uh, microsporidium canis tinea corporis that required an, uh, systemic antifungals for a very long period. And um, finally, the parents accepted our proposal of a metabiotic stem cell uh, transplantation. Um, but he didn't have a general identical donor, and the best mud was an eight, uh, eight out of ten match um, from, uh, from Portugal. So, um, at that time, we referred him again to our BMT unit, but at this time, our BMT unit refused to accept the patient because they said they didn't have experience in this kind of patient. So, we had to propose him abroad. And while waiting for the authorizations to come, he developed um, splenomegaly that, that led us to the diagnosis of portal hypertension uh, that was caused by a um, liver nodular regenerative hyperplasia that was confirmed by biopsy. And um, 
which led to a very prolonged hospitalization because of um, uh, some GI bleeding caused by esophageal varices uh, rupture. Uh, at that time, things were very, very difficult because he had recurrent episodes of GI bleeding. He was hospitalized for a very long time and um, uh, he developed fever, fever and he had this uh, pul uh, pulmonary nodule uh, that was uh, admitted to be an aspergilloma. Uh, the bronchoalveolar lavage didn't uh, manage to identify a pathogen and we didn't biopsy that uh, lesion so we treated with uh, um, wide spectrum antifungals and, and an antibiotic with a very slow improvement. So, in brief, we have a uh, 10, eventually 11-year-old boy with an X-linked leaky skid that had 30 kilograms and a BMI of 18. Uh, he had a liver nodular regenerative hyperplasia, but no hepatic dysfunction, but complicated with portal hypertension and esophageal var varices and splenomegaly. He had a status post multiple infections, but no uh, viral active infection. And then he had that uh, pulmonary nodule that was a probable fungal module. His uh, best um, donor was an 8 out of 10 mod. At that time, he was evaluated first in um, an international unit uh, that refused to transplant him based on the several risks. Uh, they thought it was... Um, an impossible uh, transplant to be made because he had a very risk, uh, high risk of conditioning toxicity because of the portal hypertension of a possible underlying fungal infection that would uh, be very risky in the, um, in the conditioning period. And uh, on the other hand, he had a very residual thymic function and no uh, general identical or uh, 10 out of 10 months. So this wouldn't allow proper immune reconstitution and uh, possibly not resolving his disease. So at that time, he was referred to another unit and the other units uh, had a different opinion and accepted the patients uh, because they they um, they thought that the possible benefits of a transplant overweighted the risks of uh, uh, almost certain death if he was not transplanted in the in the near future. So he was uh, finally transplanted with an alpha beta depleted PBSC from the eight out of ten months and um, and pro and uh, DLI's infusion if needed. So I will end my presentation now. Thank you for your for your time. We'll go proceed now for the for the discussion and Q and A. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to both of our speakers. Thank you to Fabio for an excellent and comprehensive overview of gene therapy and gene editing, and also to Zhao for this very interesting case presentation which illustrates some of the difficulties that we face when diagnoses are not straightforward, patients perhaps don't present when we expect them to as babies. And also it shows us the difficulty of um, sometimes the best interest of the child um, may be in our minds, but actually we have to deal with the whole family and the opinions of the family. So now what we're going to do is I'm going to hand back to Zhao, who's going to ask us um, a question about his case, and we're going to have a survey. The instructions for the survey should be after Zhao's question, um, and we will invite you to participate in the audience and see what uh, opinion you have on the case. After this, we'll take some questions and answers, and then we'll go back to Fabio's presentation, um, and he also has some questions for the audience, and we will carry out another survey. Um, so over to you, Zhao, for your question. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. So uh, I'm going to I'm trying to share my screen. Hopefully, you'll see it in a couple of seconds. So uh, can you, I think you can see it. So um, my question is regarding my presentations. Uh, uh, how would you proceed uh, with this kid? Um, the the possible answers are hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. Gene therapy, or do you think that a patient has no conditions for uh, a curative treatment, so you you'd only keep prophylaxis? Um, now we'll have uh, you'll have some time to vote, so uh, just please vote, and then we'll come back to, to for your to your answers. Thank you. 
Okay, so I think that everyone has voted. So maybe I can read out loud the, um, the, the answers that we received and then we'll proceed for the discussion. So 57% of the, of the audience voted for hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, 37% uh, voted for gene therapy, and nobody voted for, uh, no, for no conditions for curative treatment. So, um, Manfred, do you want to comment on this? Yes, I can comment on that because we got involved at some stage in this patient. So, um, we took um, the challenge to try to offer a curative treatment to this patient and gave, gave him the opportunity um, to um, have a, um, as you mentioned, alpha beta depleted um, eight out of 10 matched unrelated um, transplant. And in the end, unfortunately, we did not get to the point where we could really judge on the main um, problem, which we all saw, that there might be a bad thymic recovery after, after transplantation, because he unfortunately um, died from an infection in, in our center. So um, I think we at least can now say that um, we offered the opportunity as the majority of the audience would do, but it was a very hard way for the family on the first um, line, of course, but for us taking this decision as well. So maybe Mary goes on with um, taking other questions or commenting on that. Yes, so we have a question from Carsten Speckman, who says, did you consider gene therapy um, for this patient in the absence of a 10 out of 10 MUD? Well, this uh, was... Yes. Just... Sorry, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, Joao, you, you go on. No, um, we discussed this uh, between ourselves and uh, you, Manfred, and uh, Despina, and... Um, uh, the, the problem was the age because the uh, most clinical um, trials for gene therapy for, for these kind of kids uh, were before the age of uh, 12. So the patient was already 12. So it was a very difficult decision, but uh, there was not really an option uh, there, I think. Um, and I have another question. Um, did the parents try to get in touch with any other parents of similar patients, which might have influenced them in terms of going forward for transplant? Yes, we tried to enroll them uh, with uh, other parents, but the problem is that in, in Portugal there were no other leaky skid patients uh, that had been transplanted, so we didn't manage that to happen. Okay. And another question from um, Reem Alfeki at UCL. Um, given the portal hypertension and evidence of varices, um, was he a potential candidate for a liver transplant? Yes, he was. Uh, what we had planned was that if, uh, if he succeeded for the hematopoietic stem cell transplantation and that was uh, still an issue and uh, it wouldn't go... Uh, it wouldn't improve, he would probably need a, a hepatic transplantation after that. And that was a strategy that Manfred and I uh, had had. So you wouldn't consider um, a transplant of the liver before the hematopoietic stem, stem cell transplant? I think that Manfred can answer that uh, better than I can. Yeah, I think his liver function at the moment when we took over was not his main problem. And it's always a difficult question whether to um, put the toxicity on the liver of the patient or whether to plant first. But I think in the end, we can at least say that his liver function was not leading to uh, this dismal outcome. Okay. Um, and what, would you agree that um, really transplant was in the best interests of the child when the diagnosis was made um, right at the beginning? I think we all agree on that. Uh, the problem is that uh, it's a very difficult um, topic and uh, we discussed it very uh, lots of times, uh, even about uh, 
court decisions um, because it was a, a very special couple and Manfred can uh, comment on that and they were very dedicated to their kid and um, I would I would very I would love to hear your opinion on this Mary and Manfred um, would you uh, try to, to obtain a court order to to take this kid from parents to transplant him at the age of five when he was uh, doing very well and we had a uh, the diagnosis of leaky skin. Um, so I was going to ask you that question. <laughs> um, I think it's extremely difficult, isn't it? We always want to take parents with us in the decisions that we make. And it sounded from your presentation as if the child was actually pretty well from the age of five to eight before he got his zoster infection. Um, and we all know that transplant is more successful when you've not got infection and organ damage and it's done early. Um, but I'm not aware of, of any cases so far that have been skid or leaky skid where we've, we've taken a court order um, to, to go forward with transplant. Um, we have got a case in Newcastle at the moment of CGD where we have had to take a court order, but it's not so much that the parents don't want to do the transplant, just that they can be difficult about um, what we would consider small decisions on a daily basis and the court order has helped us to just go forward with all the, all the practicalities of doing the transplant but I think it's a very difficult area and uh, ethically very difficult questions. I don't know if anyone else wants to comment. Maybe from knowing the family I can just shortly comment on that as well. I completely agree with you Mary that it is a very difficult question and that we have usually have to take the parents with us because we need them for a successful therapy. And um, I mean, the special um, situation in the case Joao presented is that this was from the clinical point of view, not 100% clear. And the parents had the hope and the wish that maybe without the difficulties of transplantation, they might somehow get through the story. And we have experienced much more clearer cases with um, 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 a typical picture of SCID where we had pa parents who did not or who were not able to agree on our therapeutic recommendations. And even in that cases, we did not, um, let's say, force the parents um, to follow our recommendations. And if we just consider what that might result in, that we have complications as GVHD, that we need the help of the family to get the children through that, and we do a transplantation against um, their Ex, ex, expressive um, wishes. So I think it's very difficult and, and if it can be decided only on a very individual basis. Yeah, yes, I agree. Um, just going back to the question of gene therapy, um, is there a gene therapy program that would have actually taken this child who's obviously not a straightforward um, baby with common gamma chain skid? Uh, right, so there is an experience in, in a handful of patients that, uh, of an age beyond the typical ex kid uh, uh, age. Uh, two patients with, with uh, a typical leaky skid were treated in, in, in London and, and Paris, but uh, the results were uh, what you might expect, the, the gene marking and the reconstitution of the immune system was, was minimal. Uh, and there is a, a, uh, a program at the NIH led by Harry Malek at the NIID that uh, aims at offering gene therapy to patients that have received upper-identical transplantation uh, and they have lost the graft over time, which more or less phenotypically give us a leaky skid uh, situation. Uh, a paper was, was published in 2016 uh, describing this experience in uh, five patients between the age of uh, 10 and 24 years. Uh, specific, specific, data, specific data on the immune recovery was only available for two patients, and that showed some increase in CD4, CD8 cell numbers in, in, in one patient's NK cell number but not much more, uh, much more than that. What was positive uh, from that trial is that the, uh, the clinical feature of, of the patients improved. One patient had um, a massive uh, diffuse molluscum that, that resolved. And, the other, and the, both patients had a GI 
uh, complications with chronic diarrhea that also resolved. So while the, the immune phenotype did not change dramatically, uh, there was some clinical benefit uh, that, that was uh, achieved in, in those, in those uh, patients. So this trial is or still open at the NIH, but that goes back to what I said before, the availability of, of gene therapy is really patchy throughout the world. And, and for someone from Portugal to pick up and, and go to the, to the NIH is certainly uh, something that, that is uh, very difficult and possibly impossible for, for, many, for many situations. So uh, even though the uh, ability, the, the, the protocols may be open uh, in practice, but they may not be available uh, for patients like this. You are muted, Manfred. Yes, now I'm demuted. Okay, so um, I'm taking the next question from the audience. Um, Gilliam Cross is asking um, for the HSCT, why we took an 8 out of 10 donor and choosing TCR alpha beta depletion. And would you consider other approaches? Um, and another um, participant from the audience asked why not to take the father and go for um, go for maybe a combined um, bone marrow transplantation and later um, liver transplant from this donor. So um, I will take the questions as uh, if this is okay with you, Joao, as it uh, concerns the um, therapeutic part. Um, yes, um, I think it's a, a well-taken um, um, uh, question, which is very difficult to answer. So if I um, go back um, some years in time when we had to make that decision, um, we um, had, as um, Joao explained in his talk, um, parents who were emotionally um, very challenged from this decision. And we, for this reason, decided not to take them as potential haploidentical donors. As um, you all know that um, there is some um, responsibility which um, family donors sometimes take for the success of the treatment. And we didn't want to put that burden on the parents. And as I said, the liver transplant was not as near as you might um, suspect from Joao's talk um, as we had the esophageal varices, but these were quite stable and were not putting us um, um, in, um, in, in, a, in a concrete um, therapeutic problem at that moment. So we decided to go for the 8 out of 10 and to reduce the risk um, for GVHD we were thinking of some kind of graft, manip graft manipulation, and this was then the outcome of a long discussion, um, which I don't want to go uh, in detail too much. Yeah, Mary. Mary. Uh Thanks. Another question from the audience refers to common gamma chain deficiency and whether mutations are um, associated with causing miscarriages. I think perhaps in your case, the, the parent had had a miscarriage. Somebody want to answer that? Well, I can at least say that I would not know that there is any link between... Um, um, I also am not aware of a link between miscarriages and uh, mutations in the common gamma chain. Yeah. Uh, uh, I can take the next question, which is from uh, from Nacho, who is asking why the NK plus phenotype in this mutation. Uh, is there any uh, the presence of revertence? Uh, are these NK cells uh, an issue in terms of GVHD? Um, 
Uh, what we know is the, uh, the amount of uh, gamma, uh, gamma common chain that is required for the signaling of uh, different cytokines differs. So uh, apparently, and uh, that was proven by the STAT5 phosphorylation assay, um, the signaling of, uh, via the IL-15 um, cytokine uh, interleukin was preserved. So we had that uh, phenotype. And no, there was not an evidence of uh, reversion. This was indeed an, a hypomorphic mutation. Uh, as for the um, as for the issue of uh, GVHD uh, risk, I think that Mary or, or Manfred can answer it better than I can. Um, I think uh, the strategy for the depletion, um, the ex vivo depletion is important here. Um, and I'm not sure that it matters so much uh, whether you've got NK cells or not. If you've ablated the patient with the chemotherapy and then got a good GVHD prophylaxis, either with ex vivo depletion or, or with um, medication. I don't know what you think, Manfred. Well, I fully agree, Mary. I think it's it's difficult to, to say whether another strategy would have um, led to another result or to a better result. Um, yeah, no further comments I can offer on that. So the only thing perhaps um, going forward is that we will, I think, get better techniques for fighting infection and for giving a more precise graft perhaps for children like this who've had infection pre-transplant um, for example, by giving a CD45 RA depleted add back, um, we may be able to um, improve the immune reconstitution um, in the alpha beta platform particularly. Yes, and I think one question which remains for um, for um, all of us is the, the uh, question which we were discussing in detail before going this way, whether we can expect a thymic reconstitution in these patients. And maybe, Mary, you can comment on, on your experiences on that, because I think even with... Um, manipulated DLIs or um, T-cell um, 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 strategies, which we can all think of in theory, I think nobody of us knows whether this will be possible to bring patients like him back to a normal T-cell system as we would expect it after a successful um, HSCT. Absolutely. And of course, with the poor thymic function, then we raise the... Um, incidence of graft versus host disease. There's no doubt about that, especially if we start giving DLI and extra cells. Um, what we really need is a is perhaps a joint thymic transplant um, or um, one of the um, things that George Hollander was talking about in the last um, session. Um, how are we going to actually make thymic cells um, into a thymus that we can give together with patients such as this, which is, is something that people are working on very hard. Just a last comment. I think the hope is also that um, these patients will be more and more discovered earlier by uh, molecular diagnosis. And then with the um, insights that we have on, on, on outcome patients' parents, which is not the case in your case, uh, Joao, because uh, we know the, the attitude of the patients' parents who refuse uh, transplantation. But I think we probably, as time goes by, will have more the opportunity to go in early with transplantation. And this is helpful um, with the advances in, in molecular diagnosis that are more broad and uh, more easy to obtain. Okay, so thank you very much for your questions on Joao's talk. And I've got the pleasure now to take over and to guide you um, to the questions of um, Fabio, um, who gave us this excellent overview of a gene therapy and, and the challenges and the um, future and um, hopefully have a lively discussion as we had on Joao's talk. Fabio, please continue. Hey, thank you, Manfred. 
So I have uh, four questions. These are multi multiple choices question. And uh, so we, we did how we did for uh, with Joao. Uh, we'll leave you some, some time to uh, answer and then we'll discuss the, the answers and, uh, and, and we'll see where we go. Okay. So this is uh, the first question that uh, hopefully you all see, uh, and it has to do with uh, compared to hematopoietic stem cell transplant, gene therapy for primary immune deficiency has the advantage that it uses primary non-manipulated cells. It does not require a closely matched donor or C is based on 50 plus years of clinical experience. Now please vote. We're waiting a little bit. Well, Okay, so we have the answers. Uh, Seven percent. Uh, so the majority of people uh, replied B, uh, that uh, which is the right answer. So gene therapy does not require a close and matched donor, and that obviously is one of the big advantages of, of gene therapy. Uh, but the potentially, this this procedure is available to all to all patients uh, that can be uh, their own donor. So well done. The second question. The second question is gene transfer vector used in gene therapy for primary deficiency are A, based on integrated viruses, B, do not present the risk of insertion oncogenesis, C, carry all genes necessary for viral replication. Please vote. As we wait, I just want to comment on uh, on the the answers. The uh, A uh, the, the A answer uh, for the for the prior questions that uh, gene therapy uses primary normally with the cells it is not correct in the sense that the cells that are used for gene therapy need to be cultured and therefore they're no longer uh, primary and they are obviously manipulated. And uh, uh, gene therapy, unfortunately, is not based on 50 plus years of clinical experience because we have you know, 20 years, which is not little, but it's not as much as the experience that we have with hematopoietic stem cell transplant. OK, 
Okay, um, we have the answer for the second question. Uh, so uh, the majority of people responded correctly uh, that the gene therapy gene transfer vectors are based on integrated viruses, and that obviously it's a very important issue for gene therapy uh, of diseases that uh, um, affect the hematopoietic stem cells or cell in general that throughout their life, uh, uh, to the life of the patient, go through multiple uh, uh, replications. Uh, if a gene is introduced in the cells with a plasmid uh, that doesn't integrate that plasma would dilute over time uh, uh, throughout cell divisions, and the uh, effect of the expression of the plasma will ultimately be lost. So therefore, uh, integrated transfer vectors are, are critical for gene therapy of primary deficiencies. Um, the, uh, unfortunately, uh, however, these integrated vectors have the inherent, inherent risk of uh, potentially causing uh, insertion oncogenesis because they might integrate in the wrong, in the wrong region of the, of the human genome. And, and therefore, uh, gene editing is being looked at as, as a, the next step or the next uh, strategy that would, would get away from, from that risk. And these uh, integrated vectors uh, do not carry uh, the, all the genes necessary for, for uh, viral replication. Uh, in fact, they are heavily crippled. The, the, the virus that, that has become a viral vector is only able to infect the cells and transfer their genes uh, into the, uh, the genome of, of these cells, but it's not able anymore to make more copies of itself and then create a, a more copy of the virus. So that is, of course, a, uh, a safety feature of a strategy based on, on uh, integrated viral vectors. Okay, so I'm going to the third question. So question number three, in current clinical applications, gene therapy approaches for primary deficiency eliminate the disease-causing mutations? There was answer A. Answer B, can mimic the physiology, the physiological regulation of the disease-causing gene? Or C, they achieve the addition of one or more copies of, sequencing, of sequences expressing the disease-causing gene product? Please vote. Still waiting for the answers. Okay, we have the answers. Uh, the majority of the answers of the respondent uh, picked the right answer. So the uh, the current. Uh, clinical application gene, in gene therapy achieves the addition, the gene addition of a copy or more copies of a cassette uh, that expresses the, the cDNA of the, of the gene that we want to correct. Uh, it unfortunately does not eliminate the disease-causing mutation. Um, that, of course, is the goal 
of, of gene editing that would correct uh, and or in or uh, interfere with the uh, expression of the mutated gene. Uh, and unfortunately, again, gene addition as currently performed cannot mimic the physiological regulation of, of the of the gene and or the disease caused gene because the uh, the expression that we achieve is basically uh, deregulated uh, and and is dependent on the promoter that we add to the to the transfer vector that usually is a constitutive uh, promoter. Okay, I'm gonna go to our last question. Okay, uh, I named this a bonus question because I certainly did not give all the uh, notions uh, that are potentially required for, for answer the question, but I think it's, it's a question that will give us an opportunity to discuss a little more about the applications of gene therapy. The question is, of the following primary deficiency diseases, the least challenging to be treated with gene therapy would be A, selective IgA deficiency, B, ICOS deficiencies, or C, JAK3 deficient skin. Please vote. Okay, we have the answers. So 21% of the respondent uh, selected selective IgA deficiency, 10% picked ICOS deficiency, and the majority, 69% picked JAK3 deficiency kit. Now, I think that's the right answer. Uh, and that is because JAK3 deficiency kit compared to the other two uh, PIDs uh, has some uh, important uh, uh, characteristics. First, of course, we know what the gene is, whereas we don't know what the gene responsible for a selective IgA, IgA deficiency is, and therefore, of course, you cannot do gene therapy for a disease of uh, the, 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 the gene responsible for which you don't, you don't know. The second important thing, uh, the important a uh, positive feature of JAK3 skid in terms of gene therapy is that the expression of JAK3 is not finely regulated. Uh, whereas ICOS is expressed in activated cells. And, and to do gene therapy using a gene addition method, which would be the one that we could use uh, presently, we would have to use this, the uh, endogenous promoter and try to mimic uh, the regulated expression of ICOS. Whereas for uh, JAK3, uh, one could use a constitutive promoter. And, and therefore, uh, just I wanted to mention this important characteristics that one needs to consider when they uh, are interested in starting a new gene therapy uh, project, uh, uh, be, get, be it to, uh, a preclinical uh, exploratory uh, project or a clinical, uh, or a clinical idea. Uh, of course, we need to look uh, for, uh, need to look for diseases that are easy e enough uh, using easy uh, in, uh, with, qu with quotation marks. Um, if I can, I, I can just take the opportunity since we're talking about diseases that might be uh, easy or less easy to treat with gene therapy to answer one question that was in, in the chat uh, uh, that uh, asked for uh, whether or not um, DNA repair diseases are a good candidate for gene therapy or are 
for gene editing or uh, for or they are excluded altogether. So they are, they are not excluded altogether. Of course, uh, if a, a gene editing, the genetic machinery doesn't work well, the very first uh, integration of uh, a, the corrected uh, genetic material may be difficult. Uh, but once the, um, the gene editing has achieved the homologo recombination uh, di uh, directed, uh, um, integration, then we should we should expect some uh, improvement of the uh, machinery and therefore a potential uh, improve a potential uh, better uh, efficiency of, of the following events of uh, integration. Uh, I have to say that there are um, ongoing projects of trying to use gene editing for Artemis deficiency and therefore. Uh, we should see some results for, for this uh, group of diseases soon, hopefully. And I'll stop there. Great, Fabio. Thank you very much for your brilliant talk and the questions. I think many things have become much clearer to me and I hope for the audience as well. And it's always a pleasure to hear you talking about this topic. Um, so. I just want to say that, unfortunately, we just decided not to take further questions for Joao's talk. So please just put in questions for Fabio, because otherwise we might get a little bit um, um, confused. And um, I think it's it's um, good. there's good reasons to give Fabio 10 minutes or nine minutes left now to answer your questions. So I start with a first question, which is difficult, from Carsten Beck, Beckmann from Freiburg. Um, why there is no um, insertional mutagenesis observed, observed in ADA-deficient patients? Could you please comment on that, Fabio? Right, yes. Yeah, so th this is a, a important question and one that's been around for a while now. Um, there, I don't think we have a clear answer. Uh, the only thing that I can think of uh, that can usually answer is that the biology of ADA deficiency is very different from that of uh, x linked skid or um, the Wiscott Aldrich syndrome. Uh, in for both cases, for both the x linked skid and the Wiscott Aldrich syndrome, the gene uh, that is responsible for disease is a proliferation signal. So the gamma chain, as you, as you know. Uh, drives a, a, a cell signal that ends in, that ends in proliferation. The, uh, and the Wiscott Aldrich syndrome gene is a gene that regulates the expression of cytokines like IL2 that are also very important for cell proliferation. ADA is not a proliferation, or the ADA enzyme does not help with proliferation. It helps with cell survival. So I think the, uh, the advantage that we give to the cells uh, when, when the ADA uh, expression is restored is not as strong as the one that, that is given by correction of the gamma chain of, of the Wiscott Aldrich syndrome protein. In those cases, this additional proliferation advantage that is given may uh, contribute, may cooperate with a, a, a cell in which an oncogene has been activated and create a proliferation that ends up in malignancy. Whereas in ADA deficiency, that cells would survive, but is not pushed, not stimulated to, to proliferate. And perhaps just that difference uh, explains why uh, ADA deficiency has not shown uh, um, uh, insertion oncogenesis. We have to say that Genes, oncogenes like LMO2 have been targeted and have been found to be targeted, not targeted, but have been found to uh, harbor integration close to them in ADA deficient uh, skin patients treated with gene therapy, uh, just as uh, they've been found in the other two disorders. So it's not a different distribution of the integration sites that explains the lack of insertion oncogenesis in ADA skin, but uh, Possibly uh, this this biology of of the uh, of the diseases that is so different. Thank you, Fabio. So, sticking with the theme of ADA skid, um, Rosie Haig in Glasgow asks you um, if we have a clean skid with no infections that ADA deficient. 
would you opt for gene therapy or an alpha beta depleted haploid, assuming that both options were available? Right. Uh, so I would, they are available. They say they're available. So if gene therapy is available, I would start with gene therapy. Uh, and that is based on the results that we have now that unfortunately they are not published yet, but there are, there are more than 50 um, ADA skid patients that, ha that have been treated with gene therapy using the current approach with lentiviral vector mediated gene transfer. And, and Claire Booth will, will discuss these results uh, later on in, 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 the, in the program. Um, and the results are really, really good and, and solid. Um, there are cases in which, and in our own series has shown that you can have cases in, in which the reconstitution is minimal and the patients perhaps in some cases need to uh, remain on PEG-ADA enzyme replacement therapy or return uh, or be restarted on PEG-ADA. But in that case, uh, I think the chance of doing a transplant still remains. And we have not removed any major therapeutic options uh, from the patients, whereas in the, if, if the order is the opposite, if, if we apply a transplant that doesn't work, we have exposed the patients to potentially uh, the risks of a graft disease, of the risk, the risk of uh, chemotherapy that they can cause major organ issues that, that may reduce the efficacy of, of a gene therapy um, of a, of a gene therapy option. So in, in my mind, it makes more sense to start with gene therapy if the two options uh, are available at, at, with the equal, uh, equal, like, equal possibility. So I can move on to the next question, Fabio, which is uh, uh, why there is no gene therapy for JAK3 deficiency if it is relatively straightforward? Uh, it's an interesting question. Actually, gene, gene therapy was tried for a JAK3 deficiency, and it was based on a series of preclinical experiments in cell lines, even cell lines in mice. They showed that everything should work fine. Uh, the first trial that was performed in uh, at the uh, in um, uh, at the St. Jude Hospital in, in the U.S. Uh, was a failure. Uh, basically, there was not enough. A gene transfer into the hematopoietic stem cells of, of the patient, and there was no expression of, of the transgene uh, afterwards. Uh, mind you that this, this were the, were the, the very early uh, phase of, of gene therapy. It was before, was just after the results of x kit had been presented. So there was the enthusiasm of gene therapy, but, but it was uh, also during the time of the first uh, side effects, uh, side events, or the severe, serious adverse events that showed insertion oncogenesis in in, uh, in the patients in the in the French and the UK trials for x link kit. Uh, so that, as you may imagine, really dampened the enthusiasm on in uh, on the field, and uh, the people that were interested in performing gene therapy for JAK3 uh, skid never went back to the project. Basically, even even though now. That looks like a, a very good uh, target disease to, to be treated. In the US, uh, JAK3 skid is not a very common disease, uh, and therefore it might be also that uh, issues of resources and, and priorities gets into the decision of starting a program for, for this. Uh, in, in Europe, the JAK3 skid is uh, more frequent, and so there should, there should be a target. Uh, but as you see, the, the centers that are very, they are serious in developing gene therapy, uh, or they, and they have the resources, they have the experience and the tradition are not very many. And each of them has already decided to work on a specific disease. Uh, can be Artemis, can be Rag1, Rag2, uh, can be other, can be IPEX, can be other diseases. And, and therefore, I think it's really a question of uh, bad timing for, for the first experiments that was never repeated and of uh, priorities uh, at this point. But there, I don't think there is anything wrong with that disease that, that would not merit a, a second trial. I have a very um, short question. 
on the, for Fabio for the scientific scientist, but also the physician. Um, there's much concern about cost and uh, availability of these uh, diseases. Should um, is it and physicians not take uh, more part in uh, urging uh, regulation that we can have access to these? Um, uh, absolutely, uh, absolutely. I, it, that, that is a very, very important point. Uh, the only approved gene therapy um, process uh, that is now it can they can be prescribed by physician in stream valleys, the the ADA gene therapy process, and that that uh, treatment costs almost a, half a million, and therefore. Uh, the discussion of how to provide this process, this this uh, treatment to the vi the wide majority of uh, the po the target population that need it is something that needs to that needs to be uh, needs to take place. And physicians like us should be the ones to uh, advocate for a for a cost sharing uh, to, to some extent, but also try to restrain the companies that that are that have put you know so much investment in this uh, to re to limit what is the uh, what is what is the gain if you want the 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 income that they that they would make on this and try to make this especially for for rare diseases as reasonable as, as possible Thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, we've come to the end of our session. Um, I'd like to thank the speakers once again. Thank you to the audience for um, excellent questions and for voting um, with the survey. Please um, continue to your discussions in the networking lounge. Um, we look forward to seeing you there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.